thank you everyone for being here today at Citizens Climate International Get to Know Us calls. Today is May 17th, 2023, and this is call number two. We have three of them on one day on the third Wednesday of every month. We've already done our introductions, and this is our agenda today. I will move on to about us. The key conclusions of the recent assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the synthesis, and then I will focus in on what we do um, is trying to lift barriers to financial flows. Um, and those are the three things I will focus in on. And then I will talk about our recent initiatives at the World Bank and how you can get involved with us. Our solution to climate change is people, you. So thank you for being on our team. Today, the learning objectives are for you to learn about our mission, our history, our core values, and the way we work. And more and more so, it's becoming really obvious that Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate International are a conduit from the grassroots up to the UN and through our governments. So we are becoming, that's our niche in the environment movement. So carrying that communication up and down the pipeline. And I hope by the end of today, you get somewhat of an appreciation how the civic diplomacy that we do at the G7, the UN, the G20, the World Bank, all of that connects to your local volunteer ad advocacy. It's all connected. And lastly, our focus is redirecting financial flows. And a lot of it is carbon pricing, but a little bit of it is also becoming redirecting financial flows as well. Our mission at Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate International, Citizens Climate Lobby is our so-called mothership, um, is that we create the political will for a livable world by enabling individual breakthroughs in the exercise of their personal and political power. This is, um, sorry about the background noise. Uh, yeah, so this is really critical, the generation of the political will. That is what makes things happen. And we teach you how to do that using a proven theory of change. And how do we know it's a proven theory of change? is because we've actually seen it work in countries, including my own Canada. And then the most important thing is you, the people, you as individuals have powers and we help you exercise those powers, like both your personal and political power. That's where we focus. Now we have four program areas. We have a uh, what's called a resilience intelligence. You might get emails about the latest stuff that we're talking that we, you know, we're working on. Um, that is just like what's going on around the world and a summary of that. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about the other three areas where we work. It's civic diplomacy. Like I said, we also work at the do work and lobby at the UN, at the G7, the G20, the World Bank, et cetera. We a big focus of my work is uh, training volunteers to be advocates, and a lot of our work is also focused around carbon pricing. Our founder was Marshall Saunders. He was a, a very generous man, hugely generous, and um, he did a lot of work reducing poverty throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, and realized that, realized that uh, climate change was going to undo a lot of the good things that have been done. So he got this organization off the ground to train people how to become um, effective with our governments. And we train you how to organize, how we educate, you know, yourselves to, you know, learn about all these ways in which money moves around the planet and give up our hopelessness. And we just get those skills that we need to be effective with our governments. That's a lot of fun engaging in democracy and very grateful for the generosity of Marshall as well as his vision. He passed away in 2019 and I, I thank you for considering to be part of his dream for this world. We are found in, uh, we have chapters 
in uh, uh, active chapters in 50 countries, but we have nodes in 20 in 26 more countries. Uh, so for example, we don't have an active node yet in Israel. So we're looking for one. Um, we have some over 20,000 supporters outside the USA organized in 190 countries and active chapters in 50 countries. And those are just when things, you know, it started in the USA in 2007 and then Canada joined in 2010 and Australia and Sweden 2013. And by 2015, we had to develop this international division because so many countries wanted to join us. And then we eventually developed our own entity in the United States called Citizens Climate International in January, 2021. So that's about us. My next thing is key conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report of the sixth cycle of the IPCC AR6 SIN. You need me to stop at any moment or need to ask a question and are too shy, just put something in the chat. And if I don't see your question in the chat, somebody please um, interrupt me, that's okay. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is key conclusions of the IPCC report. So how do we know what what we know, and that's because of the IPCC. They've been doing this work since 2000, since um, 1988. They were formed in 1990. They produced their first reports. For those of you who don't know this, these reports take, you know, have have scientists from all over the world. Usually, between 60 and 80 scientists are the chief writers, and then they have more writers from all over the world. Usually, authors about two to 400 authors on these reports. Um, they, rec uh, they require that every single country signs off on the recommendations in this report. It's an arduous process. And there's 197 countries that actually sign off on these reports. And if you want to know more about it, you can scan this QR code uh, and um, that will tell you more about how the IPCC works. It's a wonderful graphic novel. So what did the, the latest IPCC report say? With business as usually, we are likely to reach the 1.5C early in the next decade. Actually, I don't know if you're paying attention to the news, but we are expected to cross now in 2027. Um, that will be the first time we cross that threshold. We've got a big El Nino coming and it could really start to warm up the planet. So even the IPCC is not current. It will be a temporary, but we will start um, crossing that threshold very soon, even sooner than the IPCC predicted. So now the call is for developed economies to reach net zero by 2040 and developing economies or global south economies um, by 2050. And the clearest thing, if you had to take home one message from the IPCC and it's in alignment with the intergovernment with the International Energy Agency is we must stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure now. No more. No more plants, no more coal plants, no more natural gas plants, no more new refiners. It's done. We have got to stop now. And we have to start unwinding what we have. That's the biggest message coming out. But I, there's a lot of messages in there and a lot of things that we need to do. We can do everything, everywhere, all at once. That is possible. And by doing everything, I mean, some of us, you know, it, uh, by doing everything, I mean, just knowing all the things that need to be done and then trusting others doing their work will get things done and you do your work. So at Citizens Climate International, we focus a lot on financial flows because when food systems are disrupted, people need money. You know, the financial companies have so much, uh, sorry, the fossil fuel companies have so much money and we need to start redirecting that money away from them so that we can start building the infrastructure of the future now. And as you'll see, it's not happening fast enough. And there are policies that we can do to do this. So I was looking, I listened very carefully to what was happening at the IPCC. I listened to their media release. I read through much of their report. And this was the key, key thing for me. Is there enough money? That was my question. Is there enough money? Can we do this? Can we financially absorb what's about to come? And the answer is yes. So the IPCC 2023 
uh, six assessment cycle report, synthesis report said, yep, there's sufficient global capital to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas pollution if barriers are reduced. I'm not an economist. I am used to be a teacher and I'm a mom in Northern Ontario. My first question is, what is global capital? And global capital is all the savings and investments held by banks, pensions, financial institutions, governments, and individuals. That's it. So we must stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure starting now. And we need to like quickly do all the other stuff. And there's enough money to do this. That's great news coming out of that report. So stop me at any moment. So we need to lift barriers. There are a lot of barriers to making that money flow. So Nigeria can build the technology of tomorrow and not be stuck with stranded fossil fuel assets. There, we need to, to lift those barriers. So let's talk about three of them. There are more, but these are three key ones because much of the financing of the transition will come from the private sector and we need to make that money move. And it's not right now. Since 2016, renewable energy has only taken 7% of a total of $2.5 trillion in bank loads and bond underwriting for energy activities. So since the Paris Agreement of 2015, 93% of the money that you know circulates from banks and underwriting, bond underwriting, has gone to fossil fuels, even though we know we can't build anymore. So one of the first things we all need to do is look at our own country's um, national climate risk disclosure rules for financial institutions. And if that's something you want to focus in on, we're getting a lot of experience here in Canada, and there are many documents I can send you towards. So that's one thing we need to do, is re get our national governments to create rules so we don't implode our, our system. Another thing we need is carbon pricing. Now, a reaction that most people want to do is take that carbon pricing money and put it back into programs to, you know, to fund us to get off fossil fuels. But nobody wants to pay more taxes. The good news is the carbon price alone will create that transition. All right, so back up a bit. The cost of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement will be about $3 trillion per year. That's a lot of money. Taxpayers can't fund that. We need to get the private sector moving on this. So what we have been advocating for at Citizens Climate International and Citizens Climate Lobby since 2010 is an incrementally rising price on carbon pollution or greenhouse gas pollution, give all the money back to the people, and then also include at the international level, like at the World Trade Organization, border carbon adjustment mechanisms that are taken into consideration common but differentiated responsibilities. So global North countries would pay the full price and global South countries are, um, that are, um, would pay a, a much lesser price. This incrementally rising price on carbon pollution over time sends the signal to start decarbonizing. Countries like Norway have been doing this since 1990 and they are doing very well. Same with Sweden. Give the money back to the people so you can get that price up high enough and also to help them fund the trip, you know, to, to adjust um, their household expenditures as the economy is adjusting. And like I said, we need border carbon adjustment mechanisms. Who has this policy? Minus the border carbon adjustment mechanisms. So um, Canada and Austria have versions of this. 
And if you're trained, we'll go into detail about this. But before I continue, I'm wondering if there's any questions about this or comments. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Again, sorry. Yeah, question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. The financial disclosure by large companies need to be monitored by authorities in each country. And do we have people trained at the public level, especially in uh, developing countries, to do mm -hmm. that work? Question. Uh, well, Canada is starting to do it. New Zealand is already doing it. So I think what's going to happen over time, Andre, is like what's happening with carbon pricing is that a first few countries will take the lead. And then what we're going to need to have happen, like we did for carbon pricing, is to have grants um, and, and stuff like that so that countries can build their own um, infrastructure to do this. I don't know if you know this, but at the at the World Bank, they actually, and countries actually do give money, like Canada, Norway, countries like that, do give money to global South countries to start building the institutional wisdom within their own countries to price carbon pollution. And I think what's going to need to happen is a few countries will have to go first, and then, um, and then we need... Uh, and then we need for it like that is some sort of program to build that institutional wisdom in global South countries. Secondly, just a story for you all from the World Bank with regards to climate risk disclosures. I was in a session about countries building their climate financial plans. It included Turkey, Ghana, and Pakistan. And, and, and they were all discussing the challenges of development and climate at the same time. And I listened very patiently. Um, some key things coming out of that, like Pakistan's economy has just been absolutely ripped apart by that flooding more so than anything. And, and we know there's many African countries that are, you know, in the same, same um, thing, same boat, so to speak. Um, and the Pakistan minister said, we are all vulnerable to climate change. The Ghanaian minister, Ghanaian minister, um, Ghana just found, just has recently discovered they too have oil and it doesn't want to be left with stranded assets. So I listened really patiently, waited for others to go to the microphone at the World Bank because this was a, more of, um, you know, I didn't want to, anyways, and then I went to the microphone and I asked, have any of you read or are you incorporating the United Nations Integrity Matters report into your you know, plans? And none of them had, none of them. And the Turkish minister asked me to speak with her afterwards. And then somebody from the World Bank came up to me and thanked them. So Andre, we've got to get these discussions going. We've got to get our our um, division, our, our own governments to start getting this going. And then we've got to ask for ways to help them. Yes, because uh, even if uh, the Canada and countries or New Zealand start doing it, we, we are absolutely far from doing it in the, at the national levels. For example, in Latin American country, they can listen, they can follow the uh, recommendation by World Bank and FMI, but it's complete. It's very far away from their reality right now. Uh huh. A hundred percent agreed. So it, you'll see at the end this reflected in our recommendations to the World Bank. And that's an excellent question. Does anybody else have a question before I continue? And I want you to know if this is your first time talking about climate finance, and you're feeling like, oh wow, this is a lot. If you keep coming back to these calls and get training with us, it becomes like second nature. I am a mom from Northern Ontario who used to teach special ed and mathematics. 
and now I can talk about this stuff. So you just, you get used to it over after you're with us for about three to six months, you get really good at speaking about it. And you, you can, like many of us, become a resource for your government. And we help you do that. So, okay, let's all take a breath. Any last questions about carbon pricing? So I'm gonna share one more thing about it. Anyone? All right. I am going to view the slides. So if you stay with us, we train you how to talk about this sort of climate policy and, and how to talk to your government about it. And we have many people to support you. I'm gonna just skip that slide. Okay, so lastly, reforms at the World Bank. So we need our, we need our governments to have uh, climate risk disclosures for financial institutions. We need carbon pricing and we need major reforms at the World Bank. This is the third bucket that you're gonna learn about today. Give yourself a moment, talking about reforms at the World Bank. So, at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or what are known as the COPs, you can watch much of the videos from coming from the UN right as they're happening live. And on day one last year in Sharm El Sheikh, I listened to Al Gore and Mia Motley, and I knew exactly what needed to be done. We need an end to fossil fuel colonialism. Al Gore pointed out a statistic that 96% of the renewable energy being built in Canada and the United States comes from private markets. That leaves much of our taxpayer money freed up for things like health care, dental care, child care, all these things that we're getting funded for education. You know, in, in Africa, it's only 14%. And why is that so? Because in the global South, Countries, private companies pay often pay seven times the interest rates. And that has to end. That has to end. So Mia Motley also gave a wonderful presentation, again highlighting that our multilateral development banks and the IMF and the the, the clone the financial system that we have globally is really pushing um, global South countries to have to buy fossil fuels when we and and not helping them transition their economy and she has a plan it's called the Bridgetown initiative and 500 billion dollars of private set uh, of public sector money injected in the multilateral development bank could unleash 5 trillion dollars of private finance and uh, yeah so Okay, so how does that happen? That's because the, the World Bank and the IMF and all these multilateral development banks, when they start pumping money into certain areas of the economy, that starts making it more favorable. And let's find out how favorable that is. The World Bank, according to Bloomberg Green report from January, Thank you, Catherine, for that report. Um, the World Bank uh, is set to wield a huge influence how the energy transition is financed, potentially dwarfing the promised efforts of Wall Street giants like JP Morgan and BlackRock. And in fact, without the World Bank and other so-called multilateral development banks, the dollars sitting on the balance sheet of financial firms may never be reallocated to a climate positive investments of the magnitude required to slow catastrophic global warming. So what's happening right now at the World Bank and many of the multilateral development banks and right now internationally is there's a shifting of how uh, money will be um, loaned and, uh, and the, the financial systems are shifting. And just so you know that the United States Congress controls the, the votes at the World Bank. <laughs> um, but happily, the World Bank has been tasked by the US Treasury and Janet Yellen to um, change 
called the evolution roadmap. So we're in a moment in time where we can influence. So I'm going to talk about what our amazing volunteers did. Um, we got volunteers, climate leaders from 31 countries to contact their executive directors at the World Bank. They're listed on the left. They are heroes. When I was at the World Bank and went to the microphone and told people that we got citizens to contact their executive directors at the World Bank from 31 countries, I heard gasps. I've had people come and thank me afterwards. Um, I saw, you know, I could see that people were really impressed by this work. This is not, most people do not contact their executive directors at the World Bank. So I think we, I know we had an impact while we were at the World Bank spring meetings. And I know your work that some of you on this call did was resonating. So our leaders contacted the World Bank and they had, Four ask. Um, one is to support the Bridgetown Initiative of Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados. We, it's not negotiable. We want all reforms at the World Bank to be grounded in human uh, rights and gender equality. That's not negotiable. We want citizens or demand that citizens are given the opportunity to share meaningful input into the reforms. And what hap and it has to go what happens beyond what happens at the World Bank civil society meetings. It's extremely expensive to go to these meetings. It's very cost prohibitive. Most most everyday people can't go there. The cost of the hotels are just out of control when they're there, and then many people can't get their visas. So we are demanding that the World Bank go into these communities and get um, feedback. And we want them to investigate how money can be, be dispensed directly to households in need and then develops an Im implementation plan to do so. And happily, what I learned at the World Bank is they have been doing pilot studies of this since 2017. So, and COVID really pushed um, what they had to do up a little bit, but still it's not at scale and they are still pilot projects. So, um, so that's what we demanded and a little bit about what we learned. And our next phase, and we will be discussing it as a group, so these may not be our final asks, but we are um, heard from Indigenous communities that they do not want the UN Global Biodiversity Framework lands protections of 30 by 30 to be included in, in that, that, those um, the UN Global Biodiversity Plans because they don't want the UN Northern National Governments to come and, and take over their lands. They have their own governance structures and they've been, they know how to take lands, take care of their lands. They've been doing this forever. So this is one thing um, because we're worried about land grabs. Um, secondly, we want the, well, the financing must address the longer term needs of uh, building climate resilient infrastructure. Most infrastructure projects at the World Bank are 10 years, but infrastructure usually takes 30 years for returns, like roads and stuff like that. Rail lines, um, they take a while to get their financial return uh, from concept all the way to when it's finally economically being really beneficial to the economy. So we need longer term loans, but also some of these climate resilient um, and climate uh, biodiversity projects that must be done will take generations to yield the results, but they must be done. So we need the the the, the World Bank to to consider, you know, how they can have longer timelines and what that might look like. And we so that's nextly we need to protect. Uh, uh, we must uh, not only protect countries from climate crisis, but also the stranded assets. So we're calling on there to be guardrails for financing. That's going to be one of our official asks. Uh, the World Bank Group and the private partnerships must abide by the UN document integrity matters. They should not be investing and, um, in things that will lead to stranded assets or greenwashing. And hampering the capacity of the multilateral development banks to unwind global economies from fossil fuels is a global framework to do so. So we need actually the UN to have some sort of global framework so that the multilateral development banks can say, we have to do this because this is the global framework. So we're calling upon a global framework to unwind from fossil fuels. 
these pieces of advice all came from listening very carefully at the spring meeting. So I'm wondering if there's any questions before I go on to the last part of this call. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So we focus on carbon pricing mostly, but we are pushing financial flows. We need reforms in our own countries on climate risk disclosures. We need to help countries to do that. And then lastly, we're also doing work at the World Bank. Any questions or comments? I thank you for being on this. This is really geeky stuff, and but it's really important following the money. Okay, we're almost done. Let me share my screen. All right. Um, these are actions you can take and our volunteers will be um, empowered to do so next week. Um, there is opportunities to give feedback at the World Bank. There's opportunities to give feedback to a group that is sending feedback up to the G20, um, which we'll meet in the, in the fall. And then there's a, a, an action right here called um, that you can all do um, right now, if you wish, um, power your planet. Power Our Planet is, um, let me just grab it. I think it should be in the chat. Yeah, there we go. Power Your Planet. If you could consider signing this, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Uh, just to show the governments and financial institutions around the world that we would like for there to be, um, it's not us, this is Global Citizen. I'm going to read it for you, and then you can decide if you want to sign it, and the link is in the chat. The problem, and Global Citizen's a great organization. They are awesome, and they're not generally climate. They're mostly development, but they have taken this on big time, and they're wonderful. So the problem is we're at a critical juncture. Climate change and inequality are posing unprecedented challenges that require urgent action, and who can help? Um, well, we demand that the global financial reform free up the funds needed to build a sustainable, equitable, and just world. And what you can do is sign the petition to power our planet. Um, it will go to the world leaders and the financial institutions. It's asking to keep promises already made um, that they must free up the funds and they want the uh, fossil fuel companies to pay. Um, so that's it. That's an action you can take right now if you so choose. Or you can uh, put it in your put it in your notes and uh, consider signing it later. So And that's it for that. And if you stay with us, you will learn through multiple training sessions how to become a citizen climate lobbyist. There's and we train you how to lobby, we train you how to work with media, train you how to do grassroots outreach, grass tops engagement. You give about five to 10 hours a month. And after about six months, you get really good at this stuff. We, talk, we have our core values, we really focus on this. And when you really understand our core values and we, we do talk a lot about it, um, it really guides your work. Most importantly, we meet, we encourage you to meet your, with your group every month. Um, Canada has been doing this since September, 2010. And, I, and I, we meet internationally on what are called global check-in calls um, once a month on the second Tuesday of the month at the same sort of time of day that we meet on these calls as well. And it's amazing checking in with our leaders around the world. We are offering um, if you are interested, 